Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New Books in Irish Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Aidan Beattie, one of the hosts of this channel. And today we'll be talking to Kean T. McMahon about his new book, The Coffin Ship, Life and Death at Sea During the Great Irish Famine. Professor McMahon teaches at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he is an associate professor of history. Uh, He grew up in Dublin, emigrated to Canada as a teenager, and moved to the United States in 2003 to pursue his PhD in history at Carnegie Mellon University. Since graduating in 2010, he has published two books and over half a dozen peer-reviewed articles on the history of the 19th century Irish diaspora. His first monograph, The Global Dimensions of Irish Identity, Race, Nation, and the Popular Press, 1840 to 1880, analyzed the adventures of John Mitchell and the other young Ireland exiles to examine changes in Irish racial identity in the mid-19th century. His newest book, which we'll be talking about today, The Coffin Ship, Life and Death at Sea During the Great Irish Famine, has just been published as part of the Glucksman Irish Diaspora book series at New York University Press. Kian, thank you so much for making time to talk to us today. Aidan, thanks very much for having me. So uh, to start, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and also why and how you came to write a book like this? Well, thanks very much, Aidan. And as I said, thanks again for for having me on your podcast. This is a a, a great enterprise and an exciting uh, an exciting new adventure or venture, I should say, um, for all of us uh, in Irish studies. I look forward to following it. Um, so I uh, I came across this uh, idea for this book. I've been I should say I've been studying migration and emigration for. Um, since I started my PhD at Carnegie Mellon in about 2003. And, um, you know, when I first moved to the United States, um, I, I knew I wanted to study Irish history, but I wasn't terribly interested in emigration. And the reason for that was that I didn't really actually know <laughs> much about it, the history and the historiography, if you will, of emigration. I was interested in life in Ireland and how life in Ireland operated uh, and I wanted to do my PhD on that. And um, I felt as if studying immigration would get me away from that. But then I read this fantastic book uh, called uh, Emigrants and Exiles uh, by Kirby Miller. And, you know, it blew my mind open in, in, uh, as to what the history of Irish emigration and migration could be. And it really showed me and opened my eyes to the fact that a really effective histories of emigration need to be rooted in the social, political, cultural history of Ireland at the time. And so when I made that connection that I could, that I could do emigration history in a way that is also a history of Ireland itself, I knew that I was onto something that I could, that I could that that would keep my interest. Do you know what I mean? Because as an immigrant, I suppose part of what I'm doing, you know, part of what we're all doing, you know, when we study these things is we're kind of studying ourselves or we're trying to make sense of and add meaning to our own lives. So I think maybe with with that was part of it is that I I didn't envision my experience as an immigrant as being separate from Irish history or Ireland. I I, I viewed them of, as a whole. So that's how I got started on it. And then in the coffin ship in particular, while I was at Carnegie Mellon, you know, one of the great things is about studying at Carnegie Mellon is, is that it's, as you well know, it's across the road from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and so as a graduate student, I could go back and forth uh, across the hollow and, and I, could, I could see papers and attend lectures on, on, on both universities. And one evening I went I went there because uh, a, a professor who I who I thought very highly of, um, Marcus Redeker, was working on a new book called The Slave Ship. And uh, he was telling us about uh, how, the sources he was using, the questions he was asking, the way he wanted to approach this new book. And, you know, I walked home uh, from that lecture. And I thought, geez, you know, we should do something like that. We should do more stuff like that in Irish history, you know? Like, what would a book like that look like? And like it literally like, like Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, like psh, I realized like, oh, wait, the coffin ship. Oh, that's so obvious. <laughs> so that's when the project started. But I had to finish. I had to finish the, the dissertation I was working on. My advisor, David W. Miller, uh, told me that uh, working on two books at the same time was not a good idea. 
So, so I finished the first and got started on this one. So that, that sounds like good advice. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of interested in maybe going into a little bit of, of the influence of Marcus Redeker on your work. Um, obviously, he's someone who, who very much sees history through a kind of an Atlantic lens. So what does it mean to see the Irish famine as a kind of an Atlantic event rather than just a, a domestic island event or, or a British Isles event? Yeah, no, that that's that's a great question. You know, um, to 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 me, it goes back to that original um, kind of posture or, or angle that I that I that I felt I I wanted to pursue in immigration studies, which which means to not to separate uh, one side of the ocean from the other, but to try and explore it um, as a whole, as a network, um, and so. W- I'm also influenced beyond uh, Marcus Redeker and the maritime history and the social, the history from from below. But I'm also influenced, by, of course, by historians working in Irish studies. Uh, I've already mentioned Kirby Miller, but Kevin Kenny uh, has been hugely important too. Um, Kevin um, edits the book series at New York University Press, the Glucksman Irish Diaspora book series that this is part of. Um, and uh, And I should just as a little plug say that 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 working with New York University Press and Kevin Kenny and Glucksman Irish House has been a fantastic. I said that this podcast is a is an exciting new venture uh, in Irish studies, and I have to say the same is true of the Glucksman Irish Diaspora series. I'm 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 flattered to be part of it. But I will say that um, if we if we think about the ways in which we study uh, Irish migration or any kind of like transnational subject, um, there's a temptation to try and get into the old way of thinking about it, which is the compare and contrast, right? So what you would do is you would look at what people are saying and doing in Ireland. You would look at what people are saying and doing in Canada or the United States or Australia, and then you compare and contrast those two. And that and that, that's a completely valid and a, a very helpful and useful way of, of studying immigration history. The other, but but the, the the problem with that is that you can miss the connections that that, that go back and forth uh, the the in between space, if you will, um, of history. The other way, of course, is to focus on those transnational networks and to focus on the the in between spaces. But then you can kind of get yourself lost in a way in which you divorce your studies from the lived experience of really being on one one side of the ocean or the other. You know, like there really are laws. You know, like there really are traditions. Like there really are um, material impacts on on the experience. And so following from Kevin Kenny's 2003 article in the Journal of American History, what I tried to do was to was to try and do both. In other words, I'm trying to root the story in Ireland, in Canada, in Australia, in the United States. I'm trying to root it on those sides of the oceans, but I'm also really interested in exploring the networks that connect those places. And to me, the network of ships and shipping is a is a is an excuse me is an understudied um, wide open field that I that that I tried to just start to explore, but I mean in terms of maritime histories of Irish migration, like there's uh, <laughs> there's a lifetime's worth of work to be done there, and I can't possibly do it. So I, I wonder if I could get you to talk a little bit more about this thing of like what you call in between spaces and and networks. Um, obviously, your your book is not just an Atlantic history; it's a history of also migration across the Indian Ocean um, and into Australia. What what made it different to go to places like Australia? Um, and I know that there's been a, a kind of a a kind of a recognition uh, among historians of the Irish diaspora that it's not just a story of you know people in Boston talking across the Atlantic to people in Ireland. But it's also people in Boston talking to Irish people in Melbourne or in London, in Buenos Aires. Um, how much are, are, you know, or could you just kind of talk more about that, about those networks that are existing and, and what it means to migrate to Australia within all that? Yeah, yes, of course. Um, so so when I, when I, I, I said that... Um, my first book was on, uh, as you mentioned at the at the opening part, there's on was on Irish racial identity, and actually we, we, putting aside the coffin ship and the slave ship and maritime history completely, I actually just went over to Marcus Redeker one uh, 
afternoon and said, hey, I'm, I'm starting my dissertation. It's on Irish racial identity. I want to know how Irish people talked about race in the mid 1840s. I know that it's more complicated than how the Irish became white, which is like the book that everybody was talking about, that one in Wages of Whiteness. I knew there was more to it. And he said, yeah, that sounds like a good and interesting project. He said, um, you know, it's good to, to investigate how the Irish talked about racial identity. He said, I'd love to know where the Irish talked about Irish racial identity. And of course, it was like, oh, gee, I'm going to spend the next six months like <laughs> chewing this one over. Because there's a really, it ended up being a very important part of the project. What I realized was, so I, I, I looked at Irish newspapers to find what people, how people, how Irish people talked about race. They'd write editorials, letters to the editor, you know. But I also read uh, individual letters uh, and diaries of people who were moving around the world in the 18, between 1840 and 1880. And, you know, Irish people in their letters rarely talked about racial identity. Like they never talked about it. I had hoped, you know, that I would have... I would find a diary of, of one of the young Irish saying, you know, me and the boys were sitting around last night talking about what it means to be a, the Irish race, you know, but they didn't, you know, they talked about like, oh, we played backgammon and so-and-so got drunk and fell over, you know, which is funny too, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I was looking for. But what I really did find was that oftentimes, not just the young Irelanders, but, but average everyday people too, would end their letter by saying something to the effect of, uh, I uh, please find and close the copy of of my local newspaper. I've moved to Boston. I thought you might like to know. I thought you might like to read a local copy of the paper. Or here, listen. We get no good news out here. Can you send me a copy of, you know, the Limerick Reporter, right? And I realized that this was being mentioned in letters so many times that beyond the letters themselves and maybe remittances for helping people to move, it's like. Irish people were sending newspapers around the world in the mid 1800s, like all the time. And then I thought, wait, I know that the ideas about race and racial identity are in those newspapers. It's one of the things that's in there. And then I realized that's a network. So I've, I, you got the letters of what the editors are doing and what the editors think they're doing, and they'll share newspapers. But average everyday people are also sharing these newspapers. So, so when you ask the question about studying those networks and, and investigating those networks, part of what I'm trying to do is understand the ways in which Irish people develop networks of exchange, the shared information and ideas. And to me, two of the most important are the individual letter, the personal letter, and the newspapers. And so I use the letters. And so, so for my second, for the coffin ship, I said, right, I know that people are sharing information, but instead of asking what they're saying about race, I'm going to find out what they're saying and the ideas that they're sharing about, um, about, about emigration during the famine. Yeah. So, so, so Australian people are sitting in Australia. They're reading words that were ori originally written and printed and published in Dublin, in Boston, all around the world. And so I'm interested in, in spending time in that network. So, so just to kind of build off of that a little bit, I mean, they're not just sending newspapers. One of the things I, I thought was really fascinating that you did in your book is they're actually sending the, the tickets, right, to emigrate. And, and you use very kind of innovatively, you, you actually use the, the little notes that are written on the back of tickets, like do not lose this ticket. And then also just this kind of everyday utilitarian advice about how to emigrate. Um, so could you tell us more about that, about like, how do they actually, how are, where are these tickets coming from? How are people paying to migrate? Um, just the kind of the basic financial reality of what they're dealing with. Yeah. So, 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 um, I, yeah, I, I said that the letters and the newspapers were important and I, and I stumbled upon this other one, which is, which is the prepaid, uh, tickets themselves. I kind of imagine that they would be relatively boring, you know, just like a printed piece of paper might have a couple of details scrawled on there. But I was reading this um, this fantastic book. You know the way you read things and then uh, you, 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 you say, oh, that's interesting. And you put it aside and you don't know if you'll ever use it. You know, mm -hmm. like you'll need, you know, you, you, know, you, might, use, you might use a, a, an idea at a dinner party, 
you know what I mean? <laughs> pretend it's yours but but you but you but you get these ideas i was reading matthew gallman's um Ireland's Exiled Children, which is a comparative study of Liverpool and Philadelphia and the government's reactions uh, to the uh, to the famine uh, emigration from Ireland, and the opening little narrative that he gives at the start of the of the book is about somebody scribbling a, a note on the back of a prepaid ticket. Well, Aidan, I just filed that away. You know, I just I wasn't working on the coffin ship. I had I just thought. That's fascinating. You know, people were writing on the back of tickets. So then when I started the coffin ship, I went, hang on a second. I actually emailed um, Matthew Gallman. He got back to me. It was very helpful. And he shared with me where he found them. It was in the uh, Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So um, I got I got a little bit of funding to go there for for a week, I think. And uh, and yeah, there's like there's like cardboard boxes full of these, full of these tickets. So what happened was, let's say that you live in uh, Philadelphia in 1846, and you've saved up a bit of money and you want to send it across to uh, bring one of your family members over or a friend or a neighbor. Well, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. You can, you can buy a bank draft and you can send the draft over to Ireland. And that you know, it's, it's safe. The person can take the money. They can use that. They can cash it in. They can turn it into cash and they can use it to, to buy, to buy their ticket. But you could also buy a prepaid ticket, which was a really interesting kind of, um, flexible instrument. So you go in, you'd, you'd, you'd say, okay, the ticket is, you didn't actually have to put a name on it, but you could, if you wanted to, it was, it was, it was transferable in other words. But let's say you walk in, you buy the ticket, and you say, um, I want an adult and a child. And you would pay on the spot in Philadelphia. The name of the company, I should say, was the Cope family. The Cope family ran packets, packet ships. The thing about a packet ship is that a packet ship leaves at the same time every week or every month, um, the same day every month. It has a preset departure time. And the reason that that's a big innovation, it, it's an innovation that comes in around the 1820s and 30s. So it's it's flying high by the time the famine breaks out in the 40s, is that in the old days, well, pre-1820s, 30s, ships only, ships only crossed the ocean when they were full, when they were full of um, merchandise or whether they were full of passengers and stuff. So if you were a merchant and you wanted to get your uh, gear uh, across to across the ocean, and you wanted it to be there in six months. You run down to the docks. You find a spot on the ship. Well, the ship might not. The ship might leave the next day. It might not leave for two months. Packet ships were like, we are leaving on this day every month. And so, when you bought the ticket, a prepaid ticket, you had to explain this to people <laughs> because naturally, like you know, Irish people, any farming people are not going to be used to and understand how these shipping networks work. It's not something that they have experience with. So when you buy your prepaid ticket, you could write on the back of the ticket a letter explaining how the system works. You have to be there on the sixth of the month, but you have to tell them three days in advance. So you have to write a letter to them. You know, you have to, there's steps. And if you miss out on the steps, you're left behind. So the person buys the ticket they write the instructions they 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 post it to their to their friend or their family member back in Ireland the family member takes the ticket they look at it and they say you know um um this was meant to be for John but John died so we're going to send um Mary instead the tickets were transferable right you then took the ticket and you made your way to Liverpool because the Cope family didn't didn't sail between Philadelphia and Ireland. They so, sailed between Ireland, excuse me, Philadelphia and Liverpool. So you had to make your way to Liverpool. You had to present your ticket and you say, "Okay, I know the ship's leaving in two days. I'm here." When you got to the ship, when the captain took your ticket, he ripped it in half so that he had a, a um, evidence that you had kind of paid for your ticket or, you know, you were, you were entitled to a spot on the ship and you had evidence, you had your receipt 
the cap, you could do whatever you want with your ticket. You were told to hold on to it until you were finished your, your journey. The captain kept all these tickets and put them in boxes and gave them to the Cope family. And the Cope family put them in their archives. And the Historical Society of Pennsylvania has them. So when I say you have prepaid tickets with letters on them, <laughs> you only have half of the ticket. You see, so like some of the tickets are really funny. Like they end with they, they, the messages on the back end with things like, and no matter what, don't forget to, you know, and you're the historian sitting there like, don't forget, to, don't forget to what? Don't forget, don't forget. So it's the, you do get these kind of moments where um, you also have people who scribbled out every single word on the back of the letter, like they wanted to ma- maintain their privacy by destroying uh, the words that had been written on them. But yeah, that's a that's another way of these kinds of transnational networks of ideas and information um, being moved back and forth across the ocean. You also talk um, a little bit in the book, kind of at various points, about the process whereby landlords would, in some cases, um, pay for their tenants to leave, um, which is is kind of a a central part of the memory of the famine in Ireland. Um, but you seem to suggest that there's a, a kind of a fuzziness between that and eviction, uh, or that these are two halves of a, of a kind of shared process. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so this was a um, this was a tricky part of the story that I that I tried to understand as more clearly, because I I should say that it's this, the the statistics on how many people were aided in this way are difficult to nail down and i i used my own research on primary sources but i also relied on the scholarship of people who've been working on this stuff for years Cormac O'Grada, peter gray christine keneally i mean people who've been working on this for decades i leaned on them to try and get an idea of how many people were talking about the best that i could come up with was somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000. If you look at the number of people who left Ireland during the famine period, what I'm calling the famine period, so it's 1845 to 1855, that's the migration um, the migration bell curve, uh, you're looking at about 2.2 million. So 2.2 million, out of 2.2 million, we're looking at about 50 to 100,000. I'm not much of a mathematician. I crunch number. It's somewhere there in the book, but it's a it's a single digit percentage. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing to say is is that we're 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 not talking about the majority. We're talking about a small a small minority, um, working with the best statistics that we have. Okay, so there is no doubt. There is like absolutely no doubt, and I, I and I like acknowledge this in the book. I think it's important that we acknowledge. Um, the the damage and the cruelty that was that was meted out to many peasant families during the famine by landlords, like there's no they, they, I'm I'm not providing some new crazy thesis that they were all getting along fine. There were lots of people who were just flat out evicted and who died as a result. They're, they're, that 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 is part of the story. It's also true that that some farmers, or excuse me, that some landlords evicted their evicted their tenants and gave them an option and and gave them an option to emigrate agreed to pay for some or all of their journey it's also true that some landlords didn't evict but actually just f- it, it, it before evicting anyone decided to offer emigration as as an option so there's three kind of there's three sides, if you will, to that kind of evict and emigrate story, um, and I and I and I discuss all three uh, all three in the book. Of course, as the emigration historian, I'm most interested in, in the second and third. So, what I did was I went to the National Library of Ireland and I looked at the landlord papers of Wandesford in Kilkenny, who is um, who is a landlord who has a rather robust. Uh, emigration scheme. Now, there's others, of course, that have been talked about in the literature, um, Lansdowne, Palmerston, these folks. But I, but I had the papers in Wandesford. I hadn't seen a lot of research into it, so I thought I'd use that uh, uh, as a as a case study. Not that Wandesford represents all landlords, but that this was one way to get into the. And so, what I realized was 
that when Wandesford floated the idea in 1847 of paying of paying for immigration, aside from the evictions, because he did evict some, but aside from those evictions, he let it be known on the estate that anybody who wanted to emigrate, or if people wanted to emigrate, he'd be willing to pay to pay for the uh, to pay for their tickets, or you know, to pay for some of their voyage. And the reason that he wants to do that is the reason that all landlords want to do that is that they want to reduce the number of people who are actually living on the estate, because every house that that is lived upon on their estate is liable or costs them a poor rate. They need to pay a little tax essentially for the fact that a family lives there. So if they can reduce the number of families living on their estate and replace them with sheep and cattle, right? Mm -hmm. That, that will reduce their poor rates and kind of rationalize or modernize their farm. Remember that part of what's going on in Britain at the time, the British government's mindset is that maybe this is a moment in which Irish society is being, is being modernized and woven into that, as I've said, is, is a lot of, is a lot of cruelty and death. But the point is that when Wandesford lets it known, oh yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know, is anybody interested? He gets flooded with petitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that he's putting a gun to people's head and saying, you have to leave. Um, there are scores of these petitions and they're all in a nice cardboard box in the National Library of Ireland that anybody can go in and sign in as a reader and go and read. I mean, some of these are really heartbreaking. But essentially, what I think is going on, and this is my own little theory, is we know that in Ireland in the mid-19th century, there was a, a tradition or a custom called tenant right, whereby when a tenant was leaving his farm, he was entitled to some compensation for improvements that he had done while he was the tenant. So if he was the tenant for 11 years, he had... Um, rendered a field, um, changed the field from wasteland into arable. He had built uh, a shed. Whatever he had done, he was entitled to some compensation. And so the compensation came from the incoming tenant. So the incoming tenant would pay a little bit. That compensated the outgoing tenant. And it also, it also, in the context of secret societies and agrarian violence, it also was a promise from the outgoing tenant, look, I'll go peacefully. Okay, I won't cause a fight. I won't claim that that's my farm. I won't come back and try to put my brother in. I'm, get, I'm walking away. I think, having thought about it and read it, I think that it's possible that assisted emigration was in keeping with that notion of compensation, that you had farmed you were leaving, you were entitled to some compensation. So it's kind of like the luck penny, you know, when someone makes a sale and then they give like a tiny mm -hmm. fraction just to kind of sweeten the deal. I think that that might be what was going on in with assisted emigration between landlords and their tenants. So, so in the structure of your book, you, you very much follow this kind of path from the initial plan to migrate, the movement to Liverpool, and then, then you're on board the ship. Um, so if we could talk about that now, um, in a very kind of Marcus Redeker style, you talk a lot about resistance and solidarity on board the ships. What does that actually look like? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you when the emigrants get aboard the ship, um, they are coming from a place where solidarity and relationships are very heavily rooted in family, in immediate neighbors, in blood ancestry in history. And some of those people who go on the ship are actually traveling with neighbors and friends and family. So those, those networks of solidarity are in place on the ship, excuse me, but they're also traveling with people who are not from their neighborhood, who are not from their county, um, who are maybe aren't even from their religion. And so it's, it's in that difficult new phase of having to establish new forms of solidarity that I think, I think that Irish immigrants begin to open their minds to new networks of solidarity that transcend their immediate friends, families, and neighbors. So a ship is a 
fairly dangerous place and it's and passengers are subject to various forms of violence that can be violence from the natural environment storms the cold um, an open hatch you fall down a ladder you break your leg i mean there's the violence of just being on a ship and then there's the violence to which passengers were subjected by the officers and or the crew on the ship um, this often had a explicitly sexual edge to it uh, with um, young men work young sailors uh, working on the ships and having essentially access uh, to single or not necessarily single but females and the, and female um, passengers and so in order to in order to resist this kind of this kind of uh, environment of violence, um, I found that immigrants um, made friendships and engaged together in ways that were reminiscent of maybe what they might have done at home, but were that that were different because they transcended friends and family. So, for example, I have letters and diaries of sailors uh, th threatening to beat people up or going into their boxes and stealing their clothes or stealing their money or stealing their food. And like literally um, immigrants banding together and um, like fighting off the sailors, uh, throwing fists. Um, I have uh, examples of sectarianism. Again, it's an echo from where they're coming from, but sometimes Catholics and Protestants are on the ship together and sometimes they don't uh, all get along. Uh, this is especially true uh, when um, Protestant, I noticed that Protestant ministers would complain that they were trying to celebrate the Sabbath on the ship and that their Catholic neighbors uh, were too loud and too obnoxious and too much. And so you had that kind of um, you had that kind of tension, but then there's also the na the violence of the of the natural environment. So people who are seasick are helping each other. Uh, people who are falling down are being aided by each other. Surgeons are not a a there. There are very few surgeons on the Atlantic route during the famine years. So if you need help from somebody, you're probably going to find it from another from another passenger. And so I was really interested in in that and that. And, and I talk about those forms of solidarity uh, in the chapter, in chapter three, which is called life. You also in that chapter talk about something that is, it was almost kind of unexpected that, that they have to find things to just amuse themselves, right? The, you know, there's an image of these people as utterly miserable, you know, famine refugees, and yet they have to entertain themselves. So how do you entertain yourself on, you know, a six week or two month journey or even longer if you're going to Australia? <laughs> Yeah, how do you entertain yourself? And I mean, like, um, how do you manage like children? Like, mm -hmm. if you thought children were annoying during COVID, um, I can imagine uh, being uh, stuck on a ship with them. Yeah, it, it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting and kind of uh, a fun, fun part of the project. Uh, I, I quote uh, Thomas Francis Maher, um, who was exiled to Van Diemen's land in, um, after his participation in the 1848 rebellion and, um, the young Ireland rebellion, you know, and, uh, and he, and he, at one point he says, you know, he says the worst part about going on a ship is how much of the time you're bored. You know, he says that, um, you wake up in the morning, you have your tea and your, you know, biscuit or whatever. And then you go, you walk around the deck you know, and then uh, you kind of, you watch the sailors pulling in the sails or, and then, you know, you kind of go have a cup of tea um, and then you, 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 you go for a walk again. And, and he describes this day and he says, whether it's one day or, or the entire voyage, it, like it's all the same. Um, and so I found that people did, uh, did try to come back or push back against that. Some of the best examples I found of entertainment amongst the passengers themselves happened on the on the trip to Australia because the trip to Australia takes 110 days like on average whereas the trip across the Atlantic would take somewhere between uh, let's call it 35 days mm -hmm. so it's for 35 days to 110 days I mean that's that's triple uh, so so the so the entertainment so some people would bring musical instruments 
right? Just to, for them for themselves, and they would they would play music in the evenings. Uh, they would dance uh, in the same way that um, slave owners um, on and slave cap, slave ship captains would um, would force slaves to dance uh, in order to maintain their health as a way of uh, of of getting their bodies moving and circulating um, blood. Um, the surgeons on on ships like Australia, the Australian route had surgeons, and those surgeons were in, were explicitly instructed to like get the people up, get them dancing. Uh, they would do things like uh, you know who can throw the the sandbag the furthest. Um, they would um, the singing, the dancing. There was also uh, I found examples of uh, in, of of people kind of like. Um, having like a, like what we would call an open mic night, you know, where they would have like, there would be like, they, they would, they would organize into a committee. There'd be a social committee who were in charge of like, okay. And then they would go around the ship and they'd say, okay, what can you do? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've got this cool thing where I can, you know, like, I don't know, put my hands behind my back. Okay, great. We'll put you in. Um, some of the, some of them were really fun. You know, people would get up and they would, they would agree to give lectures, you know, like educated people would be like, Oh, I'll do a lecture on botany. And some of the passengers be like, Oh my gosh, please don't let him do another lecture on, botany." <laughs> you know, um, they would, they would get some really great debates, you know, like deists would get into it with like, <laughs> with, I mean, atheists, not so much, but deists would get into it with like Christian ministers about like the nature of God and all these metaphysical questions. Um, and then there's like booze, you know, of course there's like alcohol, there's a little bit of wrestling, fighting, troublemaking, chasing, you know, young people sneaking into water closets, like all of that kind of thing. It's all going on the ship. And it's a pretty, it was a really, as you, as you said, it, it was a part of the story that I didn't expect would be such a, such an interesting element. So, so you have this chapter about life and, and life obviously has multiple kind of multiple varieties, multiple meanings. And then you have a chapter on death uh, and death at sea. And yet you say that 97%, I think is the statistic you give, 97% of, of famine migrants make it alive to either to North America or to Australia, which is a statistic that seems to sit uneasily with the actual title of your book. Uh, mm-hmm. and, the kind of, and, and all of the kind of memories that that term, the coffin ship, evokes. So how, how much does, does your research... Um, kind of contradict the standard image of the of famine migration as just that these are ships where people just die in, in massive numbers? You know, that's a great question. And it's, and it's a fair question. <laughs> if it's 97%, why did you call it the coffin ship? It's a totally fair question. It's absolutely a fair question. And really the answer is, is that I called it the coffin ship because I wanted everybody to know that I'm talking about the coffin ship mm-hmm. as this idea that we have in our heads. Do you know what I mean? I, I could have called it the like 97%. It wasn't actually that bad ship. But then I would fear that that potential readers or other scholars in Irish studies might think that I'm that I don't think that the coffin ship as an idea, as like a part of Irish culture and, and the Irish memory of the famine, I would I'd be afraid that I would be n- n- not acknowledging how important that is. So call it the coffin ship because I want to drag it out into the light. I wanted to f- I wanted to ask really tough questions of this kind of trope with which we've all gotten very comfortable. And I mean, like I said, I grew up in Ireland. I to me, the coffin ships were fairly one dimensional and straightforward. Um, and I knew that there was more to it. There was more to it going on. So, in terms of the in terms of the ninety seven percent, I was really shocked to learn that for most people, most of the time, most Irish people, most of the time leaving during the famine, that the mortality rates on their ships are about what was considered normal or acceptable kind of risk at the time. So there's scholars like Robin Haynes, Ray Cohn, um, who have done like decades of research into like mortality rates at sea all over the world. Do you know what I mean? These are names that aren't necessarily 
from the, we're not familiar with in Irish studies, but I felt like that was the first place to study. I had to, to start, I had to feel like I understood, uh, um, how many, how many people, how dangerous was it to be on a ship? Let's take the famine out of it. Let's take Ireland out of it. Let's just say, and then I narrowed it down. I said, okay, how about Europeans, right? How, how, how dangerous? I have statistics on the slave, on the slave trade. I have statistics on, um, on, you know, people, Chinese laborers, Indonesian laborers going to Cuba, that kind of thing. But, uh, around the same period, but I, but I felt like I needed to get a handle on, okay, just the, and European. And then, and the, num- the best number that I could come up with based on other people's scholarship is one to 2.5%. So if you're on a ship with a hundred people, you can, in the ninth, mid 19th century, you can generally expect that one to two people are probably going to die. And if three people die, it's like, mm, that was unfortunate, but it's not a shocker. So we start off on the baseline of, of one to one to two and a half percent. And then what I did was I, I, I knew that Canada and that the route to Canada was the kind of the, the dark spot on, on immigrant mortality. I mean, it was the number tossed around was 20%, that 20% of Irish famine immigrants died. And I realized really quickly on that, 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 that 20% wasn't going to hold up for all of the famine years. I mean, it wasn't even close. It was only going to be one year in 1847. And then as I read more from Ray Cohen, who's done so much work on Europeans going into New York, I realized that it's actually only a story of Quebec. So it's only 1847 and it's the Irish going to Quebec. When you see massively inflated numbers that go crazy beyond one to to two and a half percent. So at that point, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to crunch these numbers myself. So the British Parliamentary Papers uh, recorded the annual reports of A.C. Buchanan, who was the chief immigration officer in Canada. He was based uh, in Quebec. Uh, he was actually Irish born, but uh, he, he lived in Quebec. He was, the government, he was the British government's representative, and his job was to send an annual report these reports ran about 15 to 20, you know, single space tight 19th century print, um, 15 to 20 pages report on, tell us about immigration this year. Like how many people came, how many people died, where did they go? Did you have to help them? Um, what were some, what were some, what were some aspects of this year's immigration that you noticed was strange? And so like, in a, in a world in which it's really hard to get accurate statistics on how many people are moving, right? Because not everybody was keeping numbers and when numbers were kept, they weren't recorded for posterity. Uh, A.C. Buchanan's numbers on, on immigration to Quebec during the famine are, are second to none. I mean, they're, they're, they're basically, to my knowledge, they're as good as we're going to get. So I just crunched the numbers, you know? I just, I just, I just took, I, I took the, number of, the number of dead divided by the number who emigrated and I multiplied it by a hundred and I came up with statistics on what percentage of people who crossed the ocean died. Now, luckily Buchanan also often broke it down by how many Irish, how many English, how many Scottish came. The Welsh were often rolled in with the English. Mm-hmm. So I, he gave me, he gave me statistics on how many are, so I could actually accurately gauge, first of all, what percentage of all the immigrants who came from Britain and Ireland all together during a given year died and then narrow in on, okay, now how many of them were Irish and what percentage of the Irish died? And what I learned was that outside of 1847, the rates were one to two and a half percent. Now it's true that 1849 and 1853, there is, there are cholera outbreaks not just in Ireland, this is across the Atlantic or all around the Atlantic basin and beyond. And that in those years, you see percentages of around 3%, but it has to be admitted that those 3% strike uh, all European immigrants. It's not just the Irish. So if we want to have find uh, statistics on particularly Irish with particularly high mortality rates, I mean, I, I did my best. And the only one that I could find was Ireland, was Ireland to Quebec. 
Ireland to Quebec in 1847 is a disaster. I mean, it, it is, it, everybody's talking about it at the time. We've been talking about it ever since. The mortality rates are, are crazy. Um, but what I found was that if the baseline is one to two and a half percent, I was surprised to find that the overall death rate of Irish people going from Ireland and Great Britain into Quebec in eight, and New Brunswick in 1847 was a little over 10 percent, a little over 10 percent. So then I said to myself, OK, well, where did the 20 percent come from? Like there, 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 like there must be somewhere that the. Well, what Buchanan did was because the death rates were so intense in 1847, he actually drew up this big table, and it's reprinted in the British Parliamentary Papers, in which he listed by port every ship that came, what the, the name of the ship, how many people were on it, how many people died, and where it came from. And so I broke it out. I put all the Liverpool ships together. I put all of the uh, Wexford ships together. Uh, New Ross, Dublin, Belfast, Limerick. Cork. I put them all, I, I collated these statistics by port. And I found that the two ones with the highest death rates were Cork and, and Liverpool. And Liverpool is considered an Irish port only because so many Irish people were traveling through it. The statistics came up close to 20% for that year. I think it's 18% and 17% for Cork and Liverpool, respectively. So that's what I have. That That's what I found in terms of, and again, I want to be careful. Like, I'm not trying to take away from the suffering. I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to suggest that sure it wasn't that bad. You know, like had this book been written in the 1980s, I'm sure that, you know, in the revisionist, the height of the revisionist debate, I'm sure somebody would have, would have come up with this argument that, ah, like it wasn't that bad. 10% is like outrageous. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's egregiously high. The Mediterranean nowadays, when people are crossing on those dinghies, the death rate on the Mediterranean is about three, four, five percent. This is ten percent for like a hundred thousand people. So it's outrageous. It's crazy. But I have to admit that it's not as high as popular memory would suggest. So we're we're kind of coming close to, to the end. Um, I wanted to just maybe end by asking. What's next? What, what will you do as your next project? Where is this research going to lead you to? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I really don't know. I, I mean, on the one hand, I've really found that, that, the, that, that, that maritime social history as this kind of, I'll call it understudied field in, in Irish history and in Irish studies um, is really fascinating. And I'm, and I'm trying to consider whether or not to pursue a project that that broadens it beyond the famine. Do you know what I mean? And to try and give us like a maritime social history of Irish emigration, either after after the famine to see the ways in which the steamships, right? People start taking steamships regularly around the 1860s and 1870s. Then your journey from 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 Ireland to Canada goes from 35 days to like 12 days. So that's going to have like a huge impact on all the things I've been talking about, the death rates, the entertainment, the social conditions. So I've, I've, I've considered, I've considered pursuing that, but I'm also always interested in, I've been trying to make sense of the, of Irish diaspora history more broadly and to try and like, think of a way to write a book about it that kind of, that brings this, that, that, that offers a new perspective on the history of the Irish diaspora as a whole. Um, there's, 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 there's theories, there's ways of understanding the Irish diaspora that are shaped by the writings of people like Kirby Miller and Don Akinson. Are they immigrants? Are they exiles? Are they entrepreneurs? Uh, I'm interested in, th- in, 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 a, in pursuing a project that looks at the ways in which Irish people talked about themselves and thought about themselves covering the whole period from say the early 1700s to the 21st century, because I'm interested in the ways in which our notion of what it means to be Irish has changed. And when I think about being Irish, Irishness, describing Irishness, I don't think I can come up with a better place that people do that every single year uh, than St. Patrick's Day. So I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of writing a, a history of St. Patrick's Day, 
that uh, that offers a kind of a synthetic explanation uh, for the history of the Irish diaspora as a whole. But we'll see. That all sounds very fascinating. Um, and as Kian has said, the Coffin Ship is published by NYU Press as part of their Glucksman series on the Irish diaspora. Uh, it's for, very much a book worth checking out. And thank you so much for talking to us about it. Aidan, thanks very much. It was fun.